Hello, my name is Father Boniface, and I'm a Benedictine priest and monk of St. Vincent Arch Abbey in Latrobe, Pennsylvania, and so grateful to have the chance to talk with Father Pat Anderson of the Diocese of Cleveland to discuss Pope Francis's general audience from August 30th, 2023, continuing his catechesis on evangelization. He's been giving us some examples of evangelization from among the saints, and we heard about St. Kateri or St. Kateri Tekakwitha in today's catechesis. You heard that teaching in the beginning of the hour, and Father Pat and I will be discussing it now for the remainder of the hour. Father Pat, it's great to be with you. Thanks for taking the time. It's so good to be with you, too. Happy to be with you. And let's turn to Our Lady for a moment, and we can also ask for St. Kateri's intercession for us as we enter into our discussion that we would focus on what the Lord wants us to focus on and that our listeners would be able to hear what the Lord wants to say to each of them individually. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. St. Kateri, pray for us. Well, Father Pat, as we discuss uh, Pope Francis's general audience, uh, again, the 19th catechesis in his series on evangelization, I I feel like he uh, has has saved the best wine for uh, for last. Not that I know that this is the, the end of his pontificate or anything, but just the last two series of catecheses have been so rich uh, on discernment, taking about 15 episodes throughout last fall, and now on evangelization, uh, going through 20 episodes. And those are just perfect for a Jesuit. He is, uh, mm-hmm. Jesuits are, uh, following the example of St. Ignatius, so focused on discernment, and evangelization. So I think we're really getting some treasures from our Jesuit Holy Father. But let me just open it up for you, Father Pat. Any points that you want to start with as we discuss uh, Pope Francis's teaching? Well, I was delighted to see Pope Francis turning to our Saint Kateri. And I, I like how you, you said, or Kateri. Maybe there's some listeners up in uh, Montreal or upstate New York. Uh, I've gotten the pleasure of visiting her tomb two different times in Montreal and have gone up to Arisville where, where she was born um, at the Martyr Shrine. And uh, yeah, I've just always been taken with her, her story, her witness of charism, but just her, I, I, her person, really. I, I, would, I would love to, well, I enjoyed spending a holy hour praying with her in front of the Eucharist there in, in Montreal. Actually, it's in Kanawake. It's on that Indian reservation. But I, um, yeah, I was just really delighted. I said, Pope Francis is, is spending time with uh, St. Kateri. How, how cool. But that's my start. Have, have you ever spent any time at either of those places or, or have any insights on St. Kateri? Yeah, um, uh, both places also. I one of my confreres and a, a good friend of mine was ordained a priest on her feast day, July 14th. And so he wanted to make a little Kateri pilgrimage. And he and I went mm. together to Arisville, first of all. And it's just uh, not quite at the North American Martyr's Shrine, but just a, a mile or two down the road, which is the, the birthplace, her birthplace, and a little, a little shrine that's there. Uh, not too much to see. And it's very close to the martyrdom location of St. Isaac Jogues, if I'm remembering correctly. He was down, uh, killed down by the creek and is accessible from very close to where St. Kateri was born, which is its own amazing story. I mean, we really see the blood of the martyrs being the, the, uh, the seed of the church as she was raised up in that village just shortly after his martyrdom. And so we can see an almost direct connection between the offering of his life and the birth of faith, the birth of a saint in that place. And and then uh, we went from there up to the uh, her shrine where her remains, her relics are outside of Montreal. I had been to Montreal before and didn't realize that she was there. It's on the Native American reservation just kind of outside of the city. And so you you really have to know what you're looking for in order to find it. And, and the setting I found a bit 
depressing because it's uh, it is so depressed in that reservation, which is a, a sadness I still carry. But the shrine itself, uh, where her body is, is quite beautiful, and uh, it was very moving for me to be in the presence of her relics. Uh, Father Sean and I, uh, he was a deacon at the time, so I offered Mass there, and he assisted me, and we prayed for his his ordination, and uh, it was really a beautiful, beautiful trip. So like you, I've, I've had a devotion to her and the North American martyrs. I found that shrine and their stories. Of course, they're from a variety of places, but they're commemorated there at, in Ariesville. And uh, I found that whole uh, episode in the history of the American church to be very, very moving. Yeah, super moving. And I think, yeah, the fact that it's it's accessible here in the United States and just, you know, across the border there in, in Canada. I, yeah, I, I think going just, it really connected me to the universal church in a deeper way, like the saints, you know, and martyrs. And uh, yeah, I um, just so grateful that she's part of our heritage. Yeah. And I feel, feel really connected. Yeah, and I appreciate the uh, the Holy Father's reflections in the in the Wednesday audience, and to look at her as an example of evangelization, uh, it's uh, she's she's not the first person you'd think of in terms right. of yeah uh, an example of evangelization. She's sort of like a product of evangelization, you might say, right. thinking of the the work of the North American martyrs. But Pope Francis speaks about her in terms of. Uh, enculturation in a sense because she is the first native North American woman to be canonized and the way that she learned the faith from her mother and was really at the the threshold to have a Native American mother who was Christian was already something uh, just barely happening in America in 1656 and so her mother, in that sense, evangelized her. And so in some ways, she's the, the product of the evangelization of the Jesuit missionaries, like Isaac Jokes, but also then of the uh, evangelization of, of a mother and an unbaptized father. So uh, the mother was not, uh, you know, was doing something a, a little bit uh, uh, at the edge of what was acceptable in her family or in her, uh, in her tribe. And so that's uh, that's its own interesting thing to reflect on. And Pope Francis starts there how evangelization comes to us in the, the dialect of faith. We we prefer our mother tongue and and the way that we first learn the faith makes a, a deep impression on us and really shapes the, the way that our faith continues to grow, I think, uh, over over the decades of our life. Totally. I found it. I found it powerful, yeah, that he says, you know, to be first introduced to the Lord in a family setting. You know, what we were saying and what he was saying about uh, her mother being that first teacher. And in such a simple way, right? I mean, her mother wasn't a theologian. Her mother wasn't super learned in the faith. And I even think about all that she went through. There must have been a depth, right? And And just you can you can consider one could consider how devout her mother must have been in imparting this or or how fidelity was at work but yeah just especially with with her father not being a believer yeah yeah really remarkable that uh and and admirable of the mother you know it's uh, it's one of the beautiful things we we focus our attention of course on the saints themselves but we know that nobody becomes a saint alone really by definition and and so there is a whole kind of cast of supporting mm-hmm. characters around the lives of the saints some of them are also canonized but many are not and uh, mm-hmm. seems like the the mother of saint kateri is you know one of those that we can admire as a, a supporting character and uh, likely herself a saint, but not sort of in the limelight quite in the same way that that her daughter is. Yeah, I think uh, I've I've given that some thought at times, um, and in the backstories or the context through which saints have their faith transmitted to them or are supported, you know, by by others, it's just incredible. 
And it's it's something I think it gives me a lot of of comfort and joy to realize all of us are are in this fabric of raising saints and hopefully ourselves becoming saints, obviously, through that, right? But yeah, I, I've they have so many stories of saints. I always thought it might be awesome to get a collection of stories of those who've made the saints uh, together, right? And and kind of put highlighters on uh, on those characters that you know might not might be way less known, but yet have had the the deepest impact. You know, and you think about like John Paul II. You know people who had impacted him in his in his faith and in his life like it's carmelite spirituality coming coming through i think it was a somebody like a co-worker or was it an older gentleman do you remember this story um about him wearing a brown scapular and, and and starting down that road of because of a secular carmelite or uh jan oh what's his last name uh, I don't mean yes. to put you on the spot with this. <laughs> it's just an interesting, it's, it, it, it is just an interesting thing that, uh, you know, it's always transmitted by people. And that's in, in dialect, you know, as uh, Pope Francis says, right? In ways that we can receive it and by people who often we trust the most imparting it, right? That's right. Yeah, that's right. Um, Jan Tiranowski. Yeah, uh, who You're is so an good. art admirer and follower of the uh, the Discalced Carmelites? <laughs> there you yes. go. Yeah, and had a great influence on John Paul II. One one of many people, certainly, but he uh, and beautifully as a as a layman, a secular Carmelite, as you as you mentioned, and uh, someone with a devout faith. I think he was a parishioner, uh, a fellow parishioner. Mm, if I'm mm. uh, anyway close to the the family and, you know, part of the same faith community and made a, a real impact on the future saint. Yeah. And those, uh, those, those influences are, are so critical for us to continue to grow in faith. As the Holy Father said, many of us were first introduced to the Lord in family settings by, and, and he said, especially by our mothers and grandmothers. It's interesting that he singles out mothers and grandmothers. Yeah. And, uh, there is a way that our mothers often embody faith and communicate faith. And, and it gets communicated through, as he said, simple, small gestures. Parents helping their children to learn to talk to God in prayer and telling them about his great and merciful love. And I would say, I'm now expanding on the Holy Father, but I would say also the embodiment of that love. There is a, you know, there's something amazing about mothers and the you know, it's uh, their bodies sort of belong to their children. I just have always delighted in seeing this, you know, children just sort of like climb up onto their mothers as if it's just an extension of their own body or part of their own property or something like that. Mm. I just find that so touching. Having lived in their mothers for nine months, you know, children are feel this uh, this this particular ownership over their mother's bodies. And all of that is communicating to us the kind of relationship that God has with us. There's a, a dimension of God's closeness, his imminence, which is really communicated through that accessibility, that availability, that giving over of, of the mother's body for her, for her child. God is just that accessible to us. There is also, of course, a transcendent aspect of God that he is, uh, great and in a sense at a great distance that he calls us on to and and fathers tend to embody that a bit more staying outside of us and setting a path for us and uh, often giving us a mission and presenting an ideal and being something to strive for but it's like children already kind of own their mothers and then they strive to become like their fathers and that's a really really rough uh, generalization but there is that dimension of uh, that I want to make of the not just teaching about, but actually embodying aspects of God that help us to grow in faith. We get that from both of our parents. Yeah, and we get it naturally, and it's it's the first formable memories that we have, you know. And and it's um, I, I'm sure there's there's even other ways of of uh, talking about just how impactful. <laughs> From, from this early stage and also what if that pattern is broken 
or if you know it's disrupted in some violent way or 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 even just disrupted in general how much that also impacts us right yeah absolutely yeah parents uh have the opportunity to do a great good and uh also there can be some real uh some real damage that can be done if uh, some of that is missing when parents don't live up to their calling, when they don't embody God's love, when they communicate even um, conflicting messages. Those, those things can really get, get into the heart in a way that can require some, some healing and repair. And, and we have to wonder about uh, St. Kateri, who clearly had a, a good example in her mother. We don't know exactly what the relationship with her father was like in those Iroquois tribes. The the men obviously were were more of a warrior caste. And as St. Kateri was uh, scarred by smallpox at a young age and became outcast, uh, we don't know exactly how her father responded to that. But um, well, her, both of her parents and her younger brother died, so that's how her father responded to that. Um, and other men in the tribe or other people in the tribe having uh, misunderstandings, persecutions, and uh, her, her suffering, thanks to uh, presumably her, her mother's formation, and must have been others as well, she was, and really the grace of the Holy Spirit, it's amazing at such a young age, having contracted smallpox when she was only four, how well she was able to bring that to Christ crucified, how well she was able to find mm-hmm. refuge in the cross in the midst of uh, of that suffering, both both physical and then also emotional and psychological. Yeah, that's isn't that the passion for evangelization? What what she evangelizes is when she loses her whole family and she's almost blind and she's walking through the wilderness and escaping persecution, <laughs> you know, and just how united she was to the cross, the, the passion of Jesus and her real communion that she embodied. That's just something that, that is such an amazing witness to all of us when we're going through trials and hardships. She, she wasn't a person that, that gave up, it caused her to go deeper and it witnesses to us now. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Her life became a message in that way. And, uh, you know, sometimes we uh, misuse the cross, if I can say that, and the phrase offer it up or, you know, well, that's the cross. We can end up diminishing the real suffering that's there by kind of spiritually bypassing almost saying, well, don't feel this, just, you know, look at the cross or call on the cross or something like that. Uh, The cross doesn't diminish the pain. It doesn't diminish the reality of the suffering itself, but it does give it purpose. It gives it meaning in a way that helps us to bear that suffering more fruitfully and, and more courageously. And also gives us the courage to, to reach out to others, to get the support, the help that we need and, in carrying the cross, but she gives us courage to believe that looking to the cross, finding refuge in the cross can be a support for us in the sufferings that we bear, both physical sufferings like the smallpox and the the subsequent limitations she experienced, as well as emotional and psychological sufferings and the loss of her parents, her brother, and then the persecutions of her own tribe and ultimately her own exile into a a different community, leaving upper state New York to go outside of Montreal in order to find some refuge among Christians who were there. So we see in her, as you said, Father Pat, that her sufferings and her faith became uh, not only a strength for her, but uh, also a witness for us. Yeah, incredible one for me, for sure. Yeah, I I look at... uh, just the uncertainty and the the physical maladies, and I, I just see her a person of uh, of great risk taking, of you know courage, and and, and just a, such a deep devotion and fidelity, really uh, 
yeah, it's just, it's, it's so inspiring. I find uh, also this, it's interesting. You had said at the beginning of the conference here that her being a model for evangelization is, or being chosen as a model for evangelization. Wow. I also, something I hadn't thought of much was patience. I certainly thought about trust and hope, bearing our crosses with trust and hope that those would be, those would be two things I could, I could name for Kateri, but patience, highlighting patience. And uh, I can only imagine how patient she must have been um, in this whole journey of, of being relocated and like, when Lord is, am I going to be safe? When Lord, can I find a chapel to pray? And when Lord, will I have a priest to offer mass for me or hear a confession, you know, things like this. But, uh, yeah, that's a new, a new light that is shining on her for me personally, patience in the face of difficulties and of crosses as Pope Francis says, and then Pope Francis says, he who does not have patience is not a good Christian. <laughs> I was like, whoa. <laughs> Any <Pope> other Francis. <laughs> questions? <laughs> <laughs> but it is, it is powerful to invoke her as an intercessor for patience. And, it's, and that's something I'm always struggling with, whether it's driving or, uh, you know, um, sitting through a, a meeting or you know, just different, different moments where, and, and even patience with myself, right. I'm getting over my, uh, my own scruples and, uh, my own sins and things, my patterns, but yeah, patience. I think I have a new, I think I have a new patron in her for patience. I think that's going to be like a lot of fun to, to pray with. <laughs> and we, uh, we share a great patron in St. Dymphna, whose uh, icon I have in front of me, thanks to you. And uh, I think another beautiful patron for patients, having had to tolerate the mental illness of her father and uh, abuse and ultimately even being martyred. But yeah, St. Kateri as a, as a model for patients. Patients, and I like sometimes we use the expression long-suffering, and mm, I think that's mm. the, you know, some of the challenge is uh, not suppressing on the one hand and not uh, uh, blowing something up, I suppose, on the other hand, uh, but, but being able to stay in the suffering, to endure the suffering and mm. to, to hold it and to be held in it. And, and I think that's ultimately only possible when we, we're not alone. Uh, yeah. that, that we're really crushed under suffering alone and when we can be with others and that includes being with the Lord of course that uh, we're able to to bear it and uh, and when it has a purpose when and again that's really an orientation towards other people for the most part but that was one of the discoveries of Viktor Frankl in the concentration camp was that he noticed people dying before they died because they had really given up. They had lost purpose. They had lost meaning. And then uh, everything else fell apart. All, all pain became uh, unendurable at that point. But when we have a sufficient reason, then we can endure uh, a lot of different, uh, different difficulties in our lives. Yeah. And I mean, that, that fits right in with this line of thinking. And I, I like that he didn't just close it with, if you're not patient, you're not a good Christian. He says, you know, you need Jesus. You need to open your heart to Jesus. And then he calls that the, the recipe for living well, right? Like, mm. you know, have, um, I, I almost think a heart open to Jesus, uh, patience follows that, you know, and uh, grants and it's grace that's coming through, you know, when our hearts are turned to the Lord and we're, uh, we're getting the grace we need. And she, that's what she, she shows us like grace at every moment, um, grace to endure long suffering, grace to endure a hardship, uh, a difficult situation. But as you just said, with the Lord, um, not alone. Um, something I keep going back to always from my 30 day retreat was, uh, that, you know, isolation is really hell. And when we're alone, it's so difficult. But as you say, you know, when, when we know there's another there walking with us and we're not alone, Jesus, that's, that's the great promise of Emmanuel. He's God with us. He's, 
with us every step, and he's so close to us in the darkest hour. John Henry Newman said, uh, when you're alone, you're never more, uh, you're never less alone when you're alone. Um, mm. The idea that it, it opens us up, open our hearts up to, to the recognition that Christ is waiting for us there. Those, those are moments to really pray for, for deepening of faith. And really, they are these tremendous moments of opportunity for intimacy with the Lord, right? And, and really being drawn into his life properly, uh, as, as Kateri was. Mm. Yeah, so beautiful. Yeah, to, to meet the Lord in, in those times of solitude is, is something that we grow into. Uh, sometimes it's, uh, it sounds nice, but how do you do it in reality? Uh, how do you experience God's closeness in those uh, alone times? We can say uh, poetic things like, you're never alone, you're never so uh, in communion as when you're alone, but it awfully it feels awfully lonely when you're actually alone. And so <laughs> making those things uh, real, you know, often we're experiencing them through other people. We're experiencing them through, that's how it sort of gets into our nervous system, you might say. It's how it gets into our bodies so that it's a more spontaneous feeling when someone has really been there for us concretely, when someone has shown us that they, they won't abandon us, when they have uh, stayed with us, when we were in a difficult place, when someone sacrificed for us and we were able to uh, really experience that, that has a way of getting things into our, into our bones, into our nervous system, into our hearts in a way that uh, we can connect a little bit more easily with the, uh, the reality but but a reality that can be, well, that's that's spiritual and can feel a bit abstract or distant, that God is really with us. And again, we have the inspiration of the saints who encourage us in that. Um, and so, you know, when it's uh, also dealing with... Uh, Dealing with aloneness is is one way, and then you know Pope Francis talks about the tolerating others who are annoying or cause difficulties. Of course, Kateri dealt with much more than that. I mean, she dealt with real persecution, with ridicule, with even the uh, her her title Tekequitha means a scarred one, I believe, something like that, mm-hmm. and so. You know, she she carried these names that were that were shaming, ultimately, making her aimed to make her feel unworthy of love and belonging, mm-hmm. and she had to endure great difficulties. Uh, many of us are primarily challenged by people who are annoying or cause difficulties, not who are necessarily malicious or or violent in that. Although uh, many of us deal with that or have dealt with that as well, but the whole range of difficulties that makes us want to run away, that makes us want to shut down, that makes us want to to fight, but rather to stay in a place of, of trust and peace and strengthened by the Lord to remain, also strengthened by others to remain in that. Those places of difficulty with love and trust is a real challenge. Uh, it's not something that we just sort of flip a switch, have an idea, say a word, and it just happens. It's a real challenge where we have to be deeply formed, purified, refined. Those are real steps in holiness that are necessary to uh, to stay in those difficult places. Yeah, and they often it, it takes going through those those difficult places and and finding someone there who's willing to to walk with us and model for us, right? As you were saying, and when we, when we have experienced that, I, I, I was sort of questioning as you were talking, who is Kateri's person? And I think it kind of goes back to her mother, you know, her mother must've been that first experience for her of tenderness, of, of being with her, maybe in difficulty or whatever, because certainly in order for her to go into the wilderness and in, into this unknown and cling so ardently to her faith, she had to have had such a core experience of knowing her her value and worth somewhere, right? And maybe this is, uh, I, I guess I keep thinking over and over that when she lost her family, she, at some level, like maybe she 
she was adopted. Well, she was. All of us are adopted by the Holy Family, you know? I just, yeah, I just think about how could she have gone through what she did without some, some deep, the, the depth that you're even talking about here, right? Yeah, that's a lot of grace. Mm-hmm. Yeah, a lot of grace. That's what she, she definitely shows us is the, the effect of grace in, uh, as we, as we allow ourselves to be helped by the Lord and as we try to live out our faith in the midst of our daily lives and God really does transform us. He really does help us. It's not instantaneous. It takes time. It forms in us steadily and deeply. And that's, uh, that's what we have to have the patience for. So, yeah, I, I think that's, that's a whole nother, what you're getting at father <laughs> just takes time have patience with yourself. I, I remember my, my spiritual director over and over, it, it felt almost like a broken record. And at the end of uh, our conversation say, okay, you're not finished yet. Are you okay with that? <laughs> you <know? laughs> so needing more patience with ourselves and recognizing that this takes, it takes time. Yeah, that's right. It takes time. We have to be, we have to be patient with that. This, uh, I, I really like this, um, under that paragraph about patience and recipe for living well, that talking about how holiness is attractive. And, um, that's, that's something I, I think we, we just see, we see in all the saints, certainly an attraction. We want to be like them. We, um, want to, feel close to them. But I'm thinking of, of the fact that, you know, yourself going to Montreal and having, having such a beautiful encounter with her and then her really taking you deeper into the story of, the, of these martyrs and my, myself going to same, same places and, and similarly just, just being really edified and, and really moved. Yeah. By these, these stories of these saints and praying with the physical relics of these of Kateri. Um, it's a powerful thing that the saints are so attractive, that she's so attractive, that it's proper to holiness, um, that she's attractive. But there's also this feeling, and I, I, I go back to this often, is something I, I learned along the way, is that, you know, we are attracted to the saints, but they're very attracted to us. In fact, I heard it said, you know, we don't have so much a devotion to the saints as they have devotions to us. But this being attractive to the saints, uh, being attractive to Jesus, that the Lord would want to be so close to us. When I have a recognition of that, my heart does open. Um, I, I trust the Lord more and, you know, want to endure everything with him and want to give my life to him. When, when I know myself chosen, right, by him and by those who he loves, which are the saints, you know. Um, so when, when thinking about how, you know, her love of God was so appealing and her holiness was so attractive, I think about my, the ways that I'm unholy um, or unwhole and, and how that's also attractive to these saints and to God. And this just makes me want to trust and, and want to follow and want to get closer to all of them. Mm. Yeah, I love that. I mean, they're, they're not just... Uh nice pictures or concepts that are out there. They're not just uh, sort of nice prayer cards. They're real people and they're people who are not just waiting to be bothered or that we, uh, you know, celebrities that we need to find the secret password in order to get through and get their attention. But, but they're really friends and friends who want us to be with them and want to help us to grow in holiness and are attracted even to our uh, lack of patience or our uh, mm -hmm. personal difficulties, attracted because they want to support us in those places. And uh, that's a, that's beautifully said. It's so important to turn things around. Our, our faith can often feel like a lot of work. I got to work on this. I got to do this. I have mm -hmm. to fix this. This all depends on me. And instead, when we, uh, we come to know more and more that our, uh, that God is pursuing us, the saints are pursuing us, that they are initiating with us, that it doesn't all just depend on us. 
to do and to initiate, but also in a, in a significant way, just to respond and with love, to allow ourselves to be loved, to allow ourselves to be helped on the journey of faith. Yeah, and she she's a person that let herself be loved, you know, as uh, Elizabeth of the Trinity writes to her, her mother superior, you know, this is a person who is so in love with God um, that she wanted to make this vow of perpetual virginity. And I really appreciate what Pope Francis here says, that not everyone's called to make the same vow, but we're called to give ourselves daily with an undivided heart to whatever God's entrusting us to, you know, and um, in the way that we love each other and the way that we, we love God and love each other. But this this is not a small thing that this woman, this Native American woman, you know, makes this vow to perpetual virginity in, in 1679. I mean, this is pretty miraculous. And, and really, I, I think what's really beautiful is the, the Jesuit priest who was very close to her and probably had a great deal to do with her preparation for that vow. Um, and who knows who else, you know, the cast of characters that led to that vocation, right? But yeah, just it, it's very inspiring to think of her love for God, but that all of us are called to just such a deep and profound love of God and receiving his love, as, as you said. Mm. Yes, that's, uh, that's really foundational, so important for us. To, to be open to that. And you mentioned Elizabeth of the Trinity. She is uh, her final letter discovered posthumously to her mother prioress about uh, encouraging her to let herself be loved is, is so beautiful for our meditation. But that can be a real challenge uh, to, to believe that my life is good in itself, where uh, many of us are in a place that we felt loved when we did something, when we... Mm. Uh, were useful for someone, but to know, to believe, uh, to really uh, deeply trust that our lives are good in themselves, that we are loved in ourselves, that we are a gift in ourselves, is uh, something that we often need to grow into. And so the, the saints teach us that, lead us in that in a beautiful way. And I, I love... Uh, Pope Francis summarizes apostolic zeal kind of in two dimensions. One is the a bit of the doing uh, and being nourished by Jesus, prayer, sacraments, showing up for Mass. And he, he listed a number of things that St. Kateri did mm -hmm. in attending Mass every morning, adoration before the Blessed Sacrament, prayed the Rosary, lived a life of penance. And these were impressive practices. But also she had a desire she had a desire for other people to know how they are loved, a desire to spread the beauty of the Christian message. And that's uh, something for us. She did that in a particular way. Each of us has a, a personal vocation. We often think of vocations just in terms of married, single, priest, religious, but that's really a state of life. Uh, we have a personal vocation, a personal way as a priest or as a married person or as a single person or as a religious of how to live that out. My life is a message. My life is a mission. And that mission is lived through a particular state of life, but it's uh, more specialized than uh, merely that state of life. And then St. Kateri did that. She found ways that she could spread the beauty of the Christian message and fidelity to her own particular vocation. So it's a, a message and a, and a beautiful challenge for us. Absolutely. Man, a new patron for patience, a new patron for evangelization, <laughs> both things that I, I would not have thought before spending time with this document. So mm. pretty awesome. Pretty awesome. Yeah, great summary. Well, Father Pat, we're just coming to the end of the program. Could you lead us in a prayer and offer a blessing as we wrap up? Certainly. I mean, Father, thank you for the gift of the saints. We thank you for St. Kateri, in particular, the heart that she had for you, the, the faith that was transmitted by her mother. And we just thank you for the gift that she is and has been and will be for the church and leading many closer to you. We pray for all of those out there who are, including ourselves, who are struggling in the area of patience 
and in struggling in the in the way that we evangelize. We pray for all those who have not yet been evangelized and those whose hearts are hardened, that they would be softened to the ways in which you want to be known, Lord. Um, we thank you for this time together, and we we really ask St. Kateri's intercession for each of us. And all these things we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. And the Lord be with you. And with your spirit. May Almighty God bless you. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Father Pat Anderson, thank you so much for talking with me about Pope Francis's catechesis on evangelization through the example of St. Kateri Tekakwitha from August 30th, 2023. Great to talk with you, Father Pat. Always a pleasure. Thank you.